Welcome to the AIM Smart Solar Overview webinar. I am Robert Rio, Senior Vice President of AIM. A slide about AIM and my contact information is on your screen. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Mass Inc. for allowing us to use their recording facilities. Mass Inc. achieves impact through nonpartisan research from their policy center and polling group, independent reporting of politics, ideas, and civic life from Commonwealth Magazine, and inclusive civic engagement. Thank you for your assistance. I would also like to thank our presenters, AIM members, Competitive Energy Services, who have devoted significant time and energy developing this webinar. This webinar is not live, so there's no opportunity to ask questions. However, listeners may email me at the contact information on the first slide, and I will pass along the questions to our presenters and get back to you. Thank you for joining us. I will now turn it over to Zach Bloom from Competitive Energy Services. Thanks, Bob. So as Bob mentioned, I'm Zach Bloom, Vice President and Head of Sustainability for Competitive Energy Services. And I'm Matt Kamash, Director of Renewables at CES. We are here today to provide A members with an overview of the SMART program. This will include a brief history of solar incentives and mass and how we got to where we are today. We'll also look at the impact of the SMART program will have on your utility bills. Since this program is being funded by all state ratepayers, it's important to understand this context. Next, we'll look at the key drivers of solar adoption, both nationally and locally, which will lead us into a discussion of how SMART program fits within this incentive framework. Then we'll dive into the mechanics of the SMART program with a basic overview of how it works and where opportunities might exist for your facility or business. We'll look at both on-site projects as well as off-site projects and close with key opportunities and risks to keep in mind. This will include an update on the most recent status of the program, the outlook for the future, and a few key frequently asked questions to keep in mind. But first, before we explore the SMART program, we'll give you a quick rundown of who we are. CES as a, a business has been around since the dawn of deregulation in the Northeast, originally focused primarily on procurement services. Since then, we've expanded our services to cover a wide range of energy advisory and consulting options, always working on behalf of our end users. Fundamentally, we're 100% supplier neutral and product neutral providing our clients with our objective analysis and opinions on various energy projects so clients can remain informed about energy decisions. We're primarily focused in the Northeast, but have clients within operations throughout the country. To give you an idea of just how wide a range we cover, this is just a quick summary of some of our services, clients, and installed solar projects. We work with some clients focused strictly on gas or electricity procurement, and others with discrete consulting scopes for distributed generation projects such as solar, fuel cells, or combined heat and power plants. It is in this capacity that we have been involved with numerous clients in Massachusetts to look at solar renewable energy projects over the last decade. We have worked with numerous public and private clients to assess potential solar feasibility, and now have over 100 megawatts online statewide, with significantly more projects still under development or in active negotiations. That's over 5% of statewide solar generation currently. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I mean, to that end, we're doing our, our best to provide you with an objective and comprehensive overview of the SMART program. However, as with most energy projects, many key factors such as which utility you're in, what your existing electricity contracts are, your current infrastructure, and importantly, your rate code or tariff will really impact the financial viability of whatever project you're looking at. So we'll try to leave you with the key questions to consider before moving forward with the project. And as always, we welcome the chance to answer any questions that may arise after watching the video. So let's dive in here and discuss solar in Massachusetts. Matt, do you wanna kick us off here? Sure, thanks Zach. So historically, solar incentives in mass began with the Green Communities Act in 2007. This set the stage for an expansion of net metering, allowing users to be compensated for excess generation exported to the grid. This also established the framework for the solar carve-out with the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or RPS. We'll discuss RPS in more detail a little later on, but this provision requires load-serving entities to purchase a certain percentage of their generation mix from renewable energy projects in the state. And they comply with this requirement by procuring renewable energy credits, or RECs, equal to one megawatt hour of renewable generation. This solar-specific carve-out created solar RECs, or SRECs. Finally, the Green Communities Act created the Mass CEC, responsible for overseeing the qualification processes, as well as rebate programs available for additional solar, storage, or other energy efficiency projects. So the SREC carve-out came in two phases as established by the DOER. SREC 1 began in 2010 and ran until April 2014, 
and SREC 2 picked up where SREC 1 left off and continued out until 2018. The ultimate program goal targeted 1,600 megawatts to be installed for solar capacity statewide. Generally, the SREC program has incentivized adoption by creating a high value paid for each SREC generated. This has ranged from $200 per SREC, or about 20 cents per kilowatt hour, to as high as $400 or 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Systems are qualified to generate these SRECs for 10 years from commercial operations date, after which point the systems will generate class one RECs. From this incentive structure, the pace of solar adoption has generally been quicker than anticipated throughout the state, resulting in a few different phases of SREC qualification and step down incentives over time. You can see the cumulative adoption of solar in the graph provided by DUER on the right of this slide. Yeah, in, in 2016, the, the Mass Legislature authorized the SMART program, which stands for Solar Massachusetts Renewable Target. You know, th this program sought to step in where the SREC program had left off so that the solar market could continue to grow throughout the state. And over the last two years, DOAR has held numerous stakeholder meetings to draft and develop the structure of this program, which is set to be vastly different than the SREC program in both its structure and implementation. Now, this fall, the, the Massachusetts PUC approved the SMART program design and implementation plan, finding that the total program cost per megawatt hour of solar generated should be substantially lower than the previous SREC programs. Now, this is represented by the, the graph on the left here. These program costs will be recovered from ratepayers through a, a new charge called the SMART factor, which will be updated from year to year based on actual program costs. But, but more on that in a minute. You know, the, the idea behind the program is to offset some of the program costs by allowing the utilities to retain those renewable energy credits, the RECs, which would then be sold to reduce the overall cost of the program. Now, beginning in January, this smart factor will begin to go into effect, and all end users in the state will see a, a small charge on their utility bills. Now, as with the SREC program costs, CS expects that the smart program cost will continue to increase over time as more of the next 1,600 megawatts start to come online here. Great. So to provide a little bit more detail on what Zach's talking about and the impact on rate, pay for, rate payers, here we have relative electricity costs by component for a standard, standard manufacturing load with 10,000 kilowatt hours of usage. This is meant purely as an example to show the relative impact of various components making up your electricity bill. We break these costs down between supply charges on the top, which are either included in default utility service or in your current supply service contract with a third party, and delivery charges on the bottom, which are charged to you through your utility. Some of these are charges that are applied per kilowatt hour, and others are applied per kilowatt. Based on 10,000 kilowatt hours of load with a manufacturing load factor applied, the cost of generation is the most expensive cost driver at $450. This is wholesale energy, which is bought and sold through markets managed by ISO New England. The next biggest cost are the forward capacity market payments and the cost of transmission lines. And next is the cost of the renewable portfolio standard compliance in Massachusetts. And a large portion of that cost is the cost of the SREC programs. This is where a supplier will pass through the costs of purchasing the required percentage of RECs. Now to highlight here, we've inserted the expected relative costs of the SMART program factor. It's shown in bright yellow. As you can see, it is expected to be significantly less than the RPS and SREC program, at least initially, but it's still worth paying attention to over time. And importantly, unlike the SREC programs, the SMART factor will show up on the utility side of your invoice. Just to put a finer point on those numbers here, you know, let, let's say instead of 10,000 kilowatt hours, we went up by a factor of three, and now your total load is 10 million kilowatt hours. So your total electricity bill at 16 cents per kilowatt hour is now 1.6 million. That means that the RPS cost would be $200,000. Your energy efficiency would be 150,000, and the SMART will be in that $20,000 range. So combined, that's essentially 80% of just that $450 example that, that Matt had provided earlier. So now you're talking about almost 80% of just the cost of generation is embedded in just these three specific programmatic costs. It, it's something to keep in mind here on both sides, both how much you take in and how much you're spending. And you should really aim to be somewhere kind of net neutral on both. I think that's a great point. And, and to break down just a little bit further, uh, we wanted to give you some detail pertaining to those RPS costs. So based on individual components, you can see broken out in, in these graphs. 
Uh, in the top, you've got cost per megawatt hour. In the bottom, you've got estimated cost for 10,000 kilowatt hours, same as the prior graph. Uh, so you can see these relative impacts of the SREC programs in red and green here. Hopefully, no one's colorblind. Uh, again, these are just relative estimates for your standard load factor for, for 10,000 kilowatt hours. Now, what's important to consider in looking at these costs is that they have driven a large amount of solar adoption that we've seen in Massachusetts. As a result, these program costs have allowed participating customers to actually see some significant savings through installing on-site or off-site solar projects. This can be thought of similarly to the energy efficiency charge included as part of the costs on pr the previous slide that Zach highlighted, and that allows for many of the incentive programs available right now for efficiency projects. In addition, while the RPS is expensive, the increased renewable adoption that it's fostered has had a depressing effect on wholesale prices, as renewable energy has zero marginal costs on the grid. So this counterbalancing impact must be factored into any discussion about the overall RPS impact. So that discussion regarding Massachusetts rates actually leads nicely into an explanation of the key drivers behind solar adoption. That's right, Matt. So, you know, first, one of the primary factors that, that complements the incentives paid to solar projects are the correspondingly higher rates associated with electricity consumed in Massachusetts relative to other states in the country. Now, this graph here that you're looking at shows the average annual retail cost per kilowatt hour for each state back in 2016. Now, this graph was provided by the Energy Information Administration, or EIA. Now, as you can see, many of the states that have expensive incentive programs or RPS programs are among the highest cost states in this list. Generally, California, Northeast, uh, New Jersey, New York, etc., or places like Hawaii or Alaska that are remote and require a lot more transportation to create their energy. So, you know, this higher cost also means that there's a higher avoided cost for every unit of solar generation that occurs. So in turn, solar projects have become very competitive in many of the highest cost states on this list. In addition to those avoided electricity costs, federal tax credits have played a major role in encouraging renewables adoption. The investment tax credit, or ITC, available to solar systems is shown here in blue as a percentage of total installed project costs. As you can see, this value is set, up, set to phase out over time, resulting in a window of opportunity where solar projects may actually cost more in the future as the tax credit goes away. It's worth noting that the 10% tax credit that kicks in in 2022 remains there indefinitely. The production tax credit available for wind development is also shown here just for reference in the orange. The phase out of this tax credit is behind a lot of the recent interest in wind projects at both the state and national level. And that's a, an important point here. You know, as the investment tax credit is issued in year one after a project is installed, this means that in order to receive that value, the project installer or owner must have enough tax liability to use the credit. So, you know, this is a key factor when considering an upfront purchase versus a, a third party ownership structure. Uh, or power purchase agreement. And we'll get into some more contract structure info a little bit later on, but it's a, a good point here to bring up, Matt. And, and finally, you know, as you've probably seen in the news, you know, the, the costs associated with solar installations ha have fallen precipitously. So, you know, all the way back in 2010, you know, a 100 megawatt solar system would have cost roughly $457 million. And as of last year, that same 100 megawatt system would have cost roughly $103 million. You know, that's just over a seven-year stretch. I mean, th this same trend has occurred all the way back into the 70s, where instead of from four to one, you were talking about almost 70. So, you know, you're talking about $7 billion for the same infrastructure that, you know, 30 years later is a half a billion, and eight years later is, you know, almost $100 million. You know, that's a, a huge decline in cost that you just don't see every day from generating systems. So while much of this has been driven by improvements in technology and, and supply chains for modules, inverters, and balance of system, you can also see the trend in soft costs have come down quite substantially. So you know, while this graph is showing declining costs associated with utility scale solar, um, you know, this trend is, is pretty much representative of commercial as well as residential, albeit at slightly higher rates. So, you know, now that we've covered the, the history of incentives and the, the primary drivers behind solar adoption, let, let's dive a little bit deeper into the SMART program itself. So, 
As mentioned earlier in this presentation, the incentive program relies on a wholly different structure than the SREC programs. SMART can be best described as a feed-in tariff, meaning that utilities offer to pay projects a fixed rate for solar generation over a period of time. We'll get into the details of that incentive rate, but it's a transparent calculation, and importantly, the utilities will be the ones paying that credit, or that rate, to projects directly. In exchange, the utilities receive all of the associated renewable energy credits, or RECs, which, as previously mentioned, they can then sell to reduce the program costs. That incentive is paid out to projects for a 20-year term for all projects above 25 kilowatts, which are called under the program large projects. For the purposes of this presentation, we'll be focusing on those large projects rather than the smaller 25 kW and below residential scale systems. The program targets 1,600 megawatts of adoption statewide, which would come close to doubling the amount of solar capacity currently installed in Massachusetts. Yeah, and importantly, there's two distinct system types under the program that are available. You know, the, the first is the standalone system, and the second is the behind the meter system. You know, perhaps self-explanatory, but standalone systems feed generation directly into the utility grid and therefore receive a fixed level of compensation over time, regardless of the change in energy rates. Meanwhile, behind the meter systems generation directly offset a, a facility's actual consumption. Now, the incentive is paid out as an adder over and above the value of energy that's avoided, which may change over time. And we'll be going into a little bit more detail, kind of differentiating between these two options as we go through this section. Finally, the program has a declining block structure. This means that the incentives will get adjusted down once certain capacity thresholds are reached. So the program sets up a 200 megawatt block, uh, and eight of these blocks have been divided up between various utilities and project types. And as each block is filled, the incentives decline by 4%. So you know, here you can see that capacity was divvied up uh, based on each utility's proportional share of their 2016 electricity load. Now these overall capacities are, are further divided between large and small, as Matt had mentioned. And there's also an allocation between various project types. So as you can see, National Grid and Eversource East, or NSTAR, have the bulk of the program capacity. You know, about 90% of the, the total 1,600 megawatts, which makes sense since these are the two zones that make up the bulk of the electricity load in Massachusetts. So we'll, we'll return to this table a little bit later on in the pre presentation just to show a current status. So to start to get into the incentive formula a little bit, uh, everything starts with the base compensation rate. This rate was established through an auction held last January in 20, 2018. And as you can see from this table, it varies based on the utility. But generally, the base rate begins at somewhere between 14 and 17 cents per kilowatt hour. So here's the full, easy to understand formula used to calculate your incentive. The, the base compensation rate begins the incentive formula and then gets multiplied by a factor based on the size of the project. This essentially adjusts incentives higher for small scale projects where economies of scale are less available. Next, there are a series of adders or subtractors that can be applied based on various system features, types, and off-takers, which refers to the entity receiving the generation. Finally, you subtract the value of energy generated, which will change based on the type of project you're doing, whether it's standalone or behind the meter. For a behind the meter system, this is based on the three-year average of the supply rate, plus the per kilowatt hour components of distribution, transition, and transmission charges. Subtracting this value out results in your final incentive which is then fixed for 20 years. For standalone systems, this value of energy is recalculated each year so that your overall payment remains fixed. So ju just to walk through a quick example here, uh, a one megawatt system on the roof of a private entity in Eversource East would start with the base compensation rate of 17 cents per kilowatt hour times 110% multiplier, that brings it up to 18.7 cents per kilowatt hour. This then gets an additional two cent kilowatt hour rooftop adder, which brings it up to 20.7 cents. Now let's say that the, the cost per kilowatt hour value of the energy at this particular meter is 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Then this system will get an overall incentive payment equal to a little bit under 11 cents per kWh for the remainder of that 20 year period. Now there's another set of important variables that accompany how you might set up a project. Now this includes whether or not you would consider purchasing or owning a system versus allowing a third party to own the system. 
Now here, it's important to factor in the value of the tax credits, as mentioned earlier, and incentive payments, along with access to capital. So in addition, you know, project siting is a really another major component. You know, on-site projects are, are much more visible and can avoid costs right at your meter. However, these projects likely have to overcome things like size constraints imposed by the site or by the available load, especially without the uh, availability of net metering. So meanwhile, off-site projects may not offer the same compelling economics, but can provide more flexibility. And many of these projects are already in final stages of development and available to begin generating essentially almost immediately. So along with those considerations comes a discussion of the type of contract structure your firm would be interested in using. While there are numerous details and individual factors that play into this decision, generally a system purchase will come with the most financial risk as a company is using its own capital. While the site lease represents the other end of the spectrum and allows a facility to simply rent its parking space for canopies, for example. In between these ends of the risk, risk spectrum shown here, we have power purchase agreements or PPAs. A behind the meter PPA would be signed with a third party who would install and own a system and the end user would enter a long-term agreement to buy all kilowatt hours generated at an agreed upon price. This comes with no upfront cost while still reducing overall utility costs behind your meter depending on the rate offered. A utility credit purchase would rely on a similar structure but is for a system whose generation goes directly into the grid. In the case of the smart program, this would be a standalone system. And we'll get into some of the details on that a little later on. So beginning here and over the next few slides, we're gonna focus on systems installed on site behind your meter, starting with the key question of whether or not you have access to a viable site for solar. Generally, the smart program adjusts incentives based on the costs of various system types, meaning that no particular system should be overly incentivized or advantaged. The high adders available for parking canopies has made these systems competitive with more traditionally affordable ground mount and rooftop systems, for example. Exactly, Matt. I mean, the, the real intent of this program is to levelize the cost between various system types that historically have been more, ex more expensive, you know, such as smaller systems, parking canopies, or systems paired with battery storage. So no matter the space you have available or the type of system that you're interested in, there should be a, a way to optimize to make it economically competitive, regardless of the, the details. So as mentioned previously, it's also important to consider the amount of electrical load available at the site. Now currently most of the mass net metering caps have been hit, meaning that excess generation will not be net metered and compensated at that retail rate. Instead, that excess generation will have a much lower value based on its wholesale value or, or LMP, which has been as low as three and as high as you know, five cents in, in the last few years, over the course of the year. So rather than a retail rate, which has been you know, around 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's much different depending on what system you're using. So you know, if you have a site where you might consider installing solar, there's a, a few key buckets where you can derive benef benefits for each kilowatt hour generated. So Matt, why, why don't you provide a little bit more detail about these different buckets? Yeah, absolutely. And, and first, I think there's an important distinction to be made here, as, as many will jump towards just taking total costs for electricity and divide it by total kilowatt hours to come up with your overall rate per kilowatt hour. However, that's not going to accurately, ref, accurately reflect the actual impact that solar can have on your costs. For example, your monthly fixed customer charge, which is part of your overall electricity spend, is unlikely to change if you install a solar system. So to, to break down these cost streams, first off are the renewable benefits. While under the SMART program, the RECs are owned and purchased by the utilities, there still may be value to you or your company from having solar installed on your premises. Second, excess generation is important to consider. If the system is expected to generate a significant portion of its kilowatt hours at times when your facility is not using power, this is gonna have a big impact on the project economics, especially in the absence of net metering, as Zach just mentioned. Third, you have potential value from reduced capacity charges. The forward capacity market charge is based on a client's load during the one hour of peak load in ISO New England. This is called your cap tag. This hour that sets your cap tag is typically on a hot summer afternoon, at least historically in New England, when your solar system may be offsetting the amount of generation that you're buying off the grid and thus reducing your capacity charges. 
Fourth, you can offset supply purchases. A solar system will generate the majority of its kilowatt hours during on-peak, historically more expensive hours. Having a system behind your meter will impact your load profile, and besides just avoiding net kilowatt hours purchased, it will also impact your load profile for future supply contract opportunities. And finally, the, the last box here, there will be avoided utility delivery charges dependent on your utility tariff. Charges per kilowatt hour will be reduced as your overall kilowatt hour consumption goes down. You also may have the ability to influence your demand charges charged per kilowatt, depending on your rate tariff. Yeah, I mean, all of this is to say that the specific calculus for a behind the meter system is going to be unique to each system and load profile. You know, considering these factors can help you determine the overall value per kWh, which you can then use to compare to a potential PPA rate or a outright system purchase, which will then flow into essentially a financial feasibility. So now, now we'd like to talk a, a little bit more about standalone systems. You know, the, these can be systems installed on your property that tie directly to the grid, or they can be systems installed remotely that generate utility credits within your utility territory. Now, standalone systems have three options by which their generation can be compensated. You know, the first, as we had mentioned, is through virtual net metering. You know, this credits each kilowatt hour at the retail rate at which the generation is located. You know, these monetary credits can then be allocated to other bills within the same utility load zone. However, as mentioned earlier, net metering availability has currently reached its statewide caps, which means that this option is unavailable for nearly all projects. Now, this leads to the second option, which is alternative on-bill crediting, which is a, a new option available only to smart projects. Now, this option allows projects to generate utility bill credits at the basic service rate, also known as default supply rates for each utility. So historically, this rate has been around nine or 10 cents per kilowatt hour annually. Now these credits can then be allocated to utility bills similar to net metering, but you can tell you know, just from the basic service rate plus that distribution component that you're talking about a difference of for net metering somewhere was 16 cents or so uh, to on-bill credits around 10 cents or so. And then the last option is qualifying facility which is essentially the avoided LMP rate or wholesale, which once again was in that three to five cent range over the last few years, depending on weather, uh, commodity prices, et cetera. So huge difference, and you can see why this program is significantly less costly than the SREC program, both because the cost of technology has declined, but also the incentives have come down pretty drastically. So as Zach mentioned, for the standalone opportunity, we expect that most projects will be looking at alternative on-bill crediting given that the metering caps have been full in Massachusetts and, and a qualified facility does not actually generate any utility bill credits at all. So many of these projects will be looking to find creditworthy off-takers to receive the alternative on-bill credits that they generate. This option is perhaps the most widely available depending on which utility zone your facility is located in. There are currently projects at varied stages of development that can offer to sell utility bill credits for a long term, typically around 20 years. Importantly, these projects must find an off-taker in order to monetize these credits. Because generators do not have a significant utility bill themselves, the only way they can derive value from the credits is to find a utility customer who can agree to receive those monetary credits and reduce their bill accordingly. In exchange for receiving the credits, the customer will then retain a portion of that credit's value. Let's look at an example to help walk you through that. So in this hypothetical example, let's start with a calculation on the bottom of the page. So assume a standalone system generates 1 million kilowatt hours. These kilowatt hours flow directly onto the utility grid, and the utility assigns a credit equal to 10 cents per kilowatt hour. The total credit value is then $100,000. So this credit is then transferred to your utility bill. The credits are priced at a 10% discount to their value, so the host receiving the credits must remit $90,000 back to the project developer, netting $10,000 in reduced utility costs. So putting that on the flow chart, you can see that the kilowatt hours flow from the project to utility, and then utility issues that monetary credit that is assigned to the host customer, and the host customer then pays the project back to a discounted rate based on the contract that was executed between the host or off-taker and the developer building the project. So when looking at this type of project, there are some vital considerations when signing up to receive a utility bill credit. As a host, you're going to receive negative credits on your utility bill for a long term, 
so you must be certain that you don't end up buying more credits than you can use. Otherwise, your utility account may be running a large negative balance, but you're still on the hook to pay the project for all the credits it generates. While credits will roll forward, there is a true up imposed on alternative on-bill credits every March, which will look at your negative balance and true it up based on a calculation that reduce, reduces the value of those credits. Yeah, I mean, th this is a point that we always stress to our clients looking at this type of a deal structure. You know, these are 20, 25 year terms. And so thinking about not only what you're doing now, but What's the future hold? Do you build more? Are you taking away buildings? Are you putting on fuel cells that are going to reduce your import load? Are you doing LED projects that are more efficient and reduce your, your lighting bill? So you really need to think over a 20-year time horizon about not what you're going to be now, but what are you going to be towards the end of this contract term? And then use a, a safety factor so that you're not overbuying, as Matt had alluded to. So now just to, to provide an update on where the SMART program currently stands. After a couple years of development, uh, the, the program opened November 26. You know, the program received a significant number of applications, about 600 megawatts of that total six, 1,600 megawatt program that was identified. So as shown, if all of these applications to the SMART program are accepted, the Eversource West Zone, or WMECO, will have reached its full capacity. And the National Grid Zone will have dropped down from block one all the way to block seven leaving a little bit left in seven and then block eight, meaning a significantly lower reduced uh, incentive payment would be available for any project thereafter. So while this is clear evidence of a, a rush on applications, it is likely that at least some of these applications will not be accepted. I mean, some of these projects will no longer make sense at the reduced incentive rates, which will either limit the project moving forward from the financier or the developer or a whole host of other reasons. That's a good point, Zach. And, you know, besides the extra space that might still be available once these projects are, are reviewed by the DOER, it's also worth pointing out that many of the projects that do get accepted are probably still looking for off-takers for those utility credits they plan to generate. So if you're located in Eversource West, Wamiko, or National Grid, there are likely still standalone projects that might be available to you. However, given the clear, strong interest in these territories, there may be a short window of opportunity to take advantage of those projects. Yeah, I mean, that, that's true. And, and depending on your situation, it may be worth continuing to look at an on-site project behind the meter, you know, even if it's in the early stages. You know, if your project is unable to sneak in under one of the later blocks in these utility zones, then it may still be wise to move, you know, forward and, and do your due diligence for the next opportunity, not necessarily for this one. You know, as a matter of fact, many of these projects that were accepted weren't started within the, the last few months. I mean, these were old SREC 1 that transitioned to SREC 2 that never got built, never got approved for whatever reason, likely because they were too late to the party last time. And they were the ones who were essentially at the beginning of the, the waiting line this time around. So as many of these projects were accepted and initiated, you know, we're, we're going to see an influx, I think, in that next program. So important to, to keep in mind what those particulars are. Yeah, exactly. And, and further, there's a mandatory DOER program review that gets triggered after the four, first 400 megawatts in applications are accepted. So we expect DOER will be conducting this review in the coming weeks, and it could result in program alterations or changes that enable certain projects to move forward that otherwise wouldn't. Finally, if you're in Eversource East, your territory has shown the least amount of interest so far, and there could still be plenty of nice opportunities to initiate a project there. So that's the SMART program. Hopefully everyone took down some key points that may pertain to you, either in available opportunities under the program or key risks to keep in mind as you move forward with your project. But if you didn't, we have a nice summary put together for you here. So, you know, for behind the meter projects, the, the Eversource East, or, or formerly NSTAR territory, looks to be the most promising, where the maximum incentives are, are still available for new projects. You know, the other zones will need to be monitored carefully, and, and it will be worth following the DOER's review process to see if anything changes. Behind the meter projects can offer significant ben benefits that are dependent on your individual profile and tariff structure. And finally, on-site projects might consider a straightforward lease structure to help limit the risk of uncertain future kilowatt hour consumption. For standalone systems, shown on the right here, there, there are projects available either right now or in the very near future for credit-worthy off-takers, especially in that uh, Eversource West or National Grid zone. 
However, prospective credit purchasers should be wary that you would be making a long-term commitment to receive utility bill credits, and you must make sure that you can use those when you sign up to buy them. There are also some nice hedge benefits with doing an off-site project, as the credit values will be related to your cost of electricity. And finally, we, we'd like to invite Bob back here to, to help us cover some of the frequently asked questions. Uh, while we get these questions quite a bit, you know, we, we re realize that there are likely numerous other questions that might come out of this presentation. Please don't hesitate to, to reach out to, to Bob uh, or, or us and let us know what, if anything, from the SMART program you would like to discuss further. So, Bob, do you, uh, do you want to kick us off on some of these questions here? Sure. Thank you, Matt and Zach. Why are most power purchase terms limited to 20 years? What happens if I move uh, my facility or close down in the future? What happens? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, Bob. And, and 20 years is really just the industry standard. Uh, while some developers might offer shorter or longer terms, this is generally the amount of time it takes for a project owner to recover their initial investment. This is an important risk to recognize as future load and pricing may be unpredictable. However, credits are transferable between entities within the same utility zone, so this assignability is worth paying attention to in your contract. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, what happens if the sole company I select goes out of business? This is always a, a big question for those considering projects. You know, in short, it, it depends on what stage of development the project has achieved. You know, an operational project will likely be inherited by a, a bank when it goes into bankruptcy court and be treated as an asset. And, and some other purchaser is going to step in and essentially honor the existing contract or you're just going to get a bunch of free energy. Uh, you know, if the money has been invested, it's very likely that this will be viewed as an asset. Someone will step in and take that benefit on. So you know, while the project's being developed, this can be a much larger risk, though. If the company goes bankrupt or has less operating funds to continue development and origination work, you know, this is where you can get caught kind of in an in-between limbo stage. And, and selecting a good partner is very much a, an art and not a science here. Okay, great. One, one question I get asked a lot is a lot of companies have sustainability goals and commitments. Uh, does this program help me meet my green energy commitments? Yeah, uh, that's an important question and, and one that you really need to think about when you're looking at a smart project because the program's based on the utility purchasing all the recs associated with the generation. And as a result, you will not be able to make any claims that the energy you are buying is green or carbon free. That that's, uh, claim is associated with the recs that, that are being purchased. However, you, you can make claims about the role your facility is playing in supplying the lands or the financial commitment necessary to bring a new project online. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that's, a, that's a very important point. You know, of course, we live in New England with a lot of storms and hurricanes and things like that. You know, what would happen if my system got significantly damaged? Yeah, I mean, in this case, it will depend on the, the nature of that damage. You know, while some events will constitute a, a force majeure in the contract, other damages will need to be addressed by third-party system owners. So the nice thing about a, a power purchase or utility credit purchase agreement is that the project developer is only getting paid when the project is generating. So they have a, an incentive to quickly address any problems and maximize the project's efficiency over the term of the agreement. So there's a lot of symmetry there between generation and the payback for the developer and economic benefit for the off-taker. Bob, do you have any other questions after having kind of went through this? Uh, no, wanna... this, this was a very comprehensive look at the Solus Mod program. I would urge that if anybody has any questions, they should email me at the contact information provided on the first slide, and I'll be happy to forward them along to you, and then I can uh, catch up later with the person who asked the question. Great. Well, thank you guys for uh, inviting us out here. We appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to seeing what happens in the SMART program. Yeah, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Zach and Matt.